Hello everyone, today I'm here to answer questions. I, about a week ago, posted a video saying I wanted to celebrate my five years on booktube with a Q&A and a giveaway. So I'll be announcing the winners of the giveaway at the end of the video, but I wanted to do the questions first. And I had intended to actually film and upload this on the day of the anniversary, which was yesterday, June 30th, but I did drink quite a bit on Friday, the day before, so I wasn't like massively hungover, but I felt like my body had been poisoned enough and wanted to recover. And I really wanted to drink while doing this to celebrate. So here I am with a Moscow mule and a day late to actually answer the questions. So I actually made a spreadsheet. I divided them into categories and there were quite a lot of questions asked. So I'm going to do my best to answer as many as possible by combining questions and being brief, but we all know that brevity is not my strong suit. But rest assured, if you left a comment entering the giveaway, you have been entered. So I figured I would do questions about books and reading first, then booktube related questions, and then ending with more personal questions about things like my experience studying Japanese and my experience traveling, because I figured that would probably be the preference of people's interest in the actual responses. So we're going to start with questions about books and reading. Starting with questions from Nicola at Robotnik. Are there any books you've read and discussed that you feel you want to give a second chance or revise your opinion of for any reason? I'm much more inclined to do that with books that I really loved than books I disliked but I do often want to revisit books that I've highly recommended over the years, especially just because I feel like I've grown so much as a person and as a reader in the past five years. I just think, you know, there's a lot of growth and development that happens when you're in college and in your like early mid twenties. And that's the point in my life I'm in right now. So I feel like I would be more hesitant to really passionately recommend things I read five years ago because I don't really know if I think that those opinions hold up or they might have contained things that I would find questionable now. Like I really loved Ready Player One when I read it in 2013, but I didn't know better. And it's not like as universal a loved thing as I had thought it was back then because I'm aware more now more of like what poor representation looks like and own voices and the importance of that representation. I feel like I'm much more conscious and critical than I was then, even though I felt myself to be those things back then too. Um, I just think that I, that grows the more I read things, but I don't think I would really revisit anything I didn't like because usually when I didn't like anything, it was because of writing style or content. Um, and I don't think that those are worth revisiting because I don't think that I would like them now either necessarily. And there are just so many books in the world that I don't really want to go back and think about books that I already didn't like. Literary Prince asks, what book did you read when you were younger or in your teens that you found profoundly meaningful and is still important to you even now? I mean, obviously Harry Potter is the obvious answer and that still holds true. Books that immediately spring to mind that were important to me. Coraline by Neil Gaiman was a big one. I think I read that first when I was in elementary school. And I think it very is, I think it's very representative of both who I was as a child and who I am now because I like reading things that are a little off and a little spooky, um, but definitely, like thought provoking and, and well told, which I think Coraline is for sure. Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls was the first book that ever made me bawl. I just like openly weeped. It was a it was a book that my third grade teacher read to the class and my best friend Heather and I, we both were just sobbing on the floor. Maybe a little melodramatic, touch melodramatic, but it was still extremely sad. I mean, the honestly, the Twilight books definitely meant a lot to me when I was 13, 14. I was the perfect age for Twilight when it came out and yeah, those books are trash and I can I can acknowledge that now, but it was the first time in my like teenage years that I, my friends and I got really invested in a book series and would talk about it and I'd get really excited about it. And that was a catalyst for a lot of other things I read and really loved in middle school that are a lot less toxic and damaging. Like that was also how I discovered Holly Black. And while I would never recommend Twilight or pro and probably will never read it again, I do, think those books served a special purpose in a lot of lives when they were being released, but they also I think should be forgotten. <laughs> they, like they should not be treasured classics for future generations. Absolutely not. And unfortunately when I was in high school, I didn't read a lot. So I don't have too many like really special memories of books I read as a teen that I didn't read for class because I was just doing other things. So I didn't read a lot in high school. Kind of related, Alessia Swift asks, what was the first book you ever read as a mature person? Um, I don't know how we're defining that, but the first adult book I ever read that I remember was American Gods by Neil Gaiman. I figured, hey, Neil Gaiman, I like him. I've read a couple things by him that I enjoyed. It is a very distinctive reading memory for me, not only because it was the first book for adults that I ever read, but also like it definitely was for adults. There is a pretty graphic sex scene within the first definitely 50 pages wherein a man gets eaten by a vagina, 
And that is something that I will never forget. A lot of people are asking about my past and how, if, if I think that my reading preferences have changed, which they definitely have. Cynthia asks, looking on previous years, are there any books you remember liking a lot that you no longer think are good? Well, let's look at Goodreads. We're gonna go look at 12, 2012, 2013, 2014. I mean, probably a lot of the YA I read around that time. Not that there's anything wrong with YA, but you know, I don't think that those books would hold up. Like, I'm looking back at 2012. I read a lot of these books in my dorm room, my freshman year of college, uh, that I would never read now. Like a lot, a lot of the John Green books, which I did definitely enjoyed. I read some Maureen Johnson, which I also enjoyed. Ms. Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. And those were certainly very comforting, but, and I gave them pretty high ratings. I really enjoyed them when I read them. And I think that they were a good gateway into getting back into reading because like I said I didn't read a lot in high school and I was an English major in college so I was reading a lot for for school but I really definitely missed the comfort of reading and I felt very isolated and alone in college it's not worth getting into but books definitely helped me kind of get out of that a little bit so I was still isolated and alone and feeling lonely but at least I had books to comfort me so they definitely helped but I don't think that my taste that year was entirely flawed because that's the year I read The Perks of Being a Wallflower which I definitely think still holds up Kindred by Octavia Butler I definitely think still holds up that's also the first year I read A Game of Thrones for the first time so you know I don't read the same things but I don't necessarily think that like those are terrible books I mean I gave Watchmen a four star rating which I think is questionable. Um, also, Batman The Dark Knight Returns. I, I took a class on comic books, so having read them when I did, it definitely influenced my feelings on them. I wouldn't read them now, and I probably wouldn't rate them as highly. Yeah, so I think that the best answer for that is just a lot of the YA I read, I definitely wouldn't read now. But I don't think that those things would be as meaningful to me as a 25 year old as they were when I was an 18 year old. So I just think context matters a lot in terms of that. Um, and I don't I don't think that any of those books that I read and really enjoyed back then were, are bad by any means. Someone asked, what is your favorite book and favorite movie of all time? Um, I really don't think that I can answer that. I have a favorite shelf on Goodreads. And when I remember, after I read a re really notable book, I try to put it on that shelf. So, you know, at least I have a collection of things I consider favorites. So quick rapid fire on that list. Olive Kittredge by Liv Elizabeth Strout's on there. I haven't read that since high school, but I really loved it. The Great Gatsby I have read in recent years and think is phenomenal. Um, the Things That Carried by Tim O'Brien, Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami, Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman, White Oleander by Janet Fitch, The Title Zone by Sarah Moss, A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara, of course, East of Eden by John Steinbeck is a new favorite, Hearts Invisible Furies by John Boyne, definitely a new favorite, The Secret History by, Do by Donna Tart. Those are within my like top 20 books of all time for sure. And then favorite movie, that's so hard. Um, I have a Letterboxd account if you didn't know, which is basically like Goodreads, but for films. And I do try to really actively post on there and I've been trying to watch more films the past couple of years than I ever have before. And I don't remember exactly what I put on there, but there's a place for you to put your favorite films. And I think, I know at least three of them are Spirited Away, Purr, which I love, love so much. And also Whiplash, which is, it's a movie that like I had never really understood before the phenomenon of people clapping after films. But that's a film that I like, I wanted to get on my feet and clap. It's one of the most amazing endings of a film I've ever seen. And I've only seen it once, but pretty much every time my partner and I sit down to watch a movie, we could watch Whiplash. Emily asked, what books would you say cemented your love of reading as a child? And it definitely was Harry Potter. I mean, there are other things too, but Harry Potter is the thing that has stuck out the most to me and is such a, great memory that I have of growing up and spending summers with my mom and my sister reading those books. It's something that's like irreplaceable. Every single one of those books was read to me by my mom. And I was 14, I think, when the last one came out. So we were a little old for story time, but it was still like delightful. And I treasure that so much. And um, I mean, I grew up in a family of readers. So I think that undoubtedly I would have found a love of books and reading anyway, but Harry Potter has stuck in my life as something that like nothing else has. So I know it's a really tired answer, but it's also an honest one. Danny Green asks, what three books have caused you to examine your own beliefs or question your actions? Um, I don't know if I can narrow it down to just three, but um, one that immediately comes to mind for sure is Just Mercy by Bryan Stevenson, which if you're not opposed to the death penalty now, <laughs> you will be. Ooh, Reading with Patrick by Michelle Kuo is a really eye-opening book about the state of the U.S. education system, particularly in underfunded and rural parts of the country where things like um, corporal punishment are still actively practiced. And it's really hard for kids in that much of it, like abject poverty to want to read like 
American literary classics because they just aren't relative to their day-to-day -day survival, um, which are things that I think I intrinsically knew, but were phrased in a way that I had never been forced to confront them before like that. I maybe didn't love this book, but Even This Page is Right by Vivek Shraya is a poetry collection that was more eye-opening than any other poetry collection I've ever read before because it was confronting like even the whiteness of the page and white space and whiteness taking up space um, and how colonization and white supremacy have really infiltrated like every aspect of everything. Also it was Own Voice's trans representation, which I haven't read very much of and I think is always very insightful and helpful for me and important for me to learn as a cis person. So that one is really fantastic as well. Shannon Gossett asked a bunch of questions, but one she asked was, have you ever hate read anything? And yes, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child turned into a hate read. I bought it the day it was published. So I had no, I had reservations, but I didn't have any preconceptions because I hadn't read reviews or anything and I didn't know how other people felt about it, but it became so laughable. And I just, I, if it wasn't a hate read that I like relished in, I would not have finished it because it was so bad. It's so bad. I still get mad about how bad it is, like years after the reading experience. Sometimes a partner and I will just talk about like, remember the trolley witch? How fucking stupid was that? Like the queer baiting and Harry Potter being a friend of pigeons and the Chekhov's blankie. I mean, you would think I was making these things up, but I'm not, they're all in there. I had several people ask me, what my favorite Japanese classics are, which I don't know if you know me, but I really don't get on with Japanese classics, so I'm not the person to ask because I haven't really found one that I really liked. So I've tried reading Junichiro Tanazaki, I've tried reading Yukio Mishima, I've tried reading Natsume Soseki, I've read some um, Mudasaki Shikibu, I just really struggle from all different eras of anything considered like a Japanese classic or Japanese modern classic. If they're just really not for me, so I can't give you a good answer for that, and I apologize. Lydia Holmes asked, what's a book if someone mentions liking it, you feel like you've already made a friend, which I like that question a lot. I definitely feel that with David Mitchell, uh, because I think that it takes a very specific kind of, of reader to enjoy David Mitchell. For as like popular Cloud Atlas was, that's not an easy book to love, and it's not even my favorite, but like if you've given David Mitchell a chance and you're willing to kind of embrace the weirdness, and, and you can also like see and appreciate how talented that man is and, as an author. I think that makes us friends. He writes novels that take place in Japan that make me feel like I'm reading a Murakami novel, minus some of the jazz and sexism. Um, and he also can write any genre. He, like, Cloud Atlas has historical fiction, it has speculative fiction, it has sci-fi. It's pretty astonishing. So I feel like if you get David Mitchell, then I kind of get you. So I definitely feel like a, a connection to people who loved Little Life like I did, but it is a very popular book. So I don't think that makes us automatically friends, but I do feel such a sense of like understanding someone's emotional experience if they also really loved A Little Life because it means that they it, it destroyed them probably in a similar way that it destroyed me. All right, last one, and this one's not very popular, but if I found someone in real life who liked Alex and Ada as much as I did, I would definitely feel connected to them because that was a really beautiful, well-told story that had a, had a tiny little moment here on book two, but it wasn't a very uh, long lived one because of how short Alex and Ada was as a series. And I know a lot of people didn't like the art style, but if you liked Alex and Ada a lot, I feel like we could be friends. There's still so many books, book questions left. Gonna try and do this faster somehow. Let's see. So there are lots of questions about favorite childhood books, books that made me love reading. I feel like I've kind of covered that ground. And there are also quite a few books about favorite Japanese authors, which again, I don't feel like I can really answer because I haven't read that many Japanese authors. Like I, I've, I've liked some Murakamis for sure. I really like, um, I really liked uh, Out by Natsuo Kirino, but a couple of our other books I didn't like as much. Um, so I definitely feel like I still have exploring to do with Japanese authors. Ania's Beljar asked, if, if there was a book that I thought had an interesting premise, but I didn't like it, and I think I might have liked it better had it been written by someone else. And for this, I have to say Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. Firstly, I'd like it to be written by someone who's not a giant homophobe. That'd be great. But also, I really didn't get on with the writing style, and I didn't feel like he knew how to handle female characters really at all. The premise of the, the, the world building and the magic system, I think could be really interesting, and I, I would like to see it fleshed out. And just that, that world building, but it's not a heist has better female character representation and not written by a homophobe. I would really like to see that because I think that it could be really intriguing. Patrice Jones asked me, do I have book friends who I talk about books with in my community or do I depend on booktube to fulfill that need? And I definitely depend on booktube. I have friends who read a little, but like a couple books a year. And 
if they're not books that I've read or I care about, then like we can't really talk about books, right? So it's really hard to connect with friends. I'm hoping when going to graduate school, I will find more bookish readerly type people. But I am very lucky that I have a bookish mom, a bookish sister and a bookish partner. They do tend to read quite a lot and we read a lot of similar things. So I'm not like completely, um, without bookish people in my life, but I definitely rely on booktube for like day-to-day -day bookish conversations and to find people who I can really talk about books I'm reading in the moment with. Santi Kim asked if there's a book that I stopped reading and will never read again, which I just think means a DNF. And yes, I actually uh, DNF or do not finish books constantly. Now it feels like um, I didn't, I used to be much more stubborn and felt like I had to finish things if I wasn't, even if I wasn't liking them, but I'm much more over that now and just don't feel like I have time for that. Um, so like one that immediately comes to mind is The Night Circus. I tried to read it years ago. I found it super boring. Like you cannot have a book that's literally just descriptions of a circus. There's no plot to that. Like, what are you doing? So no, I'm never gonna pick up that again. No interest in that. But there are like a lot of things that I have, I've started reading and just decided, you know what? I don't need that. Let's see. Samantha asked if I have bookish buzzwords. I really love things that are character focused. Um, I often really like character driven novels. I like things that are family dramas, especially if someone's coming back home and has to confront a lost past. I think that that's really intriguing. Um, I love coming of age stories, particularly if they're about young women, but I don't like books that are targeted toward young adults. I like reading adult novels that are about the com coming of age stories, um, particularly like in college, because I think that that's a really pivotal time in growth and development that is often neglected. So that would be that, that is definitely something I'm very intrigued by. But I've honestly grown to be a kind of person where I rely much more heavily on reviews and recommendations from people on this platform than I do like bookish buzzwords or uh, publishing media press or like reading a blurb at a bookstore. I have fewer bookish buzzwords now than I do like if this particular person on booktube liked a book, I'll probably like it too. That is much more of a selling thing for me these days. All right, someone also asked me, what are your thoughts on separating the author from their work and buying books written by them? This is a complicated question that's gonna be hard to answer briefly, so I'm gonna do my best. But my perspective is a lot of authors that have entered the canon um, from like the 20th century and earlier, a lot of them were bad people and we know that. Um, but like racism and sexism, were much more prevalent and were much more socially acceptable. So they were more easily able to get away with those sorts of things. And that doesn't make them right or better, but their fame and their prevalence in society was forgiven despite their prejudices. Um, and I can choose to fault them for that. Like, I don't think I'm gonna read Flannery O'Connor because of how racist she was. Um, same for uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. I learned recently that she was super racist and that makes me less likely to read someone. I feel like a lot of people who were writing back then had a lot of privilege and that's why they were able to write and publish and be remembered is because they were probably rich and white and affluent um, and often men. And so they probably had more prejudices because of their status and who they were and society. So I'm not gonna forgive people for that. It will make me less inclined to read someone if I find out that they were a garbage person. But I feel like it, it, it's less bad to buy books by those authors because they're dead. So they're probably not gonna be getting your money. Um, their books might even be the, in the public domain so you don't have to give them money or they were published enough that they're, you can get their book secondhand and then they're definitely not getting any money of yours nor is their estate. And so you can get away with, with that a little easier than you can now. But in the year of 2018, if you are openly sexist or racist or homophobic or something else harmful and, and prejudiced and damaging and bigoted, then no, I don't really want to promote you on my channel. I don't want to say that I'm reading you and to, to give you my airspace. And I don't want to, to be voting for you with my dollars. Um, like with Gino Diaz, the things that happened with him, he's gone. He's off my shelves. I'm not going to buy anything from any, him anymore because of the choices that he made. He should know better. It's 2018. And I, I don't want to support him because any book that I buy is going to be giving money to him unless I buy them secondhand. And I think that's the best way to get around uh, supporting authors who are garbage. If you still want to read their works anyway, buy their work secondhand so they're not benefiting from your, your money. But if you do have a booktube channel and an audience, you are also giving them uh, support in a way with your time and your attention. So if you choose to talk about them on your channel, then you are still supporting them in a way um, unless you're condemning them like I am right now. So I try to be cognizant of that. I'm not gonna exhaustively research an author for any reason, but if those things come to the fore, like they did with Sherman Alexie or with Juno Diaz, then I'm going to take them off of my list. 
I just don't need to read them. There are so many books and authors in the world of people who I do not know to be garbage. So I just feel like I can get away with that. So that is kind of my, my brief perspective on that. I know that there it's a very complicated and nuanced issue that a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about. And I've also had two drinks. So, you know, I don't know how articulate or concise I'm being or clear, but I can always clarify that. I just think that's my perspective. So like, I'm not gonna give Juno Diaz my money basically. So now I'm gonna move on to the booktube section, starting with Moonbook who asks tips for someone who wants to start booktube. Um, I know this is really obvious, but like, just do it fun story. So when I started booktube, I filmed and edited and uploaded my first video, but I had it on private for a while. I don't remember how long, but I remember my sister asking me because I told her that I was doing this, like, where's your video? Why isn't it up yet? And I was like, it is up, but I just haven't made it public yet. And that's the thing that you can do. You can make practice videos. If you're not comfortable with them being seen by other people, you can make videos so you become more comfortable talking to a camera and you can get kind of the jitters out because I know it can be a thing that makes you nervous. Just like start doing it. Stop making excuses for why you can't or don't want to. If you have a cell phone with a camera and a microphone, you can make videos. And I know that that is still a barrier to entry for some, but it is at least a start. Um, or if you, have a cam if you have a laptop with a webcam, you can do that too. Um, you don't have to have fancy editing software. You don't have to edit at all. If you could feel like comfortable not editing, I don't feel that way, but like just, just start making videos and you can decide when you want people to see them um, because you can private them if you want or you can make them just like shareable by link instead of having them just like directly public. And also just like know that your voice is unique and you might feel like you have nothing unique or interesting to say, but you do um, because I question that honestly, but I feel like I've had a lot of support and people say really kind things a lot to like reassure me that I do have a unique perspective, even though sometimes I don't think I do. Um, and just have fun with it. If it's a thing that you start doing and you don't think it's fun, just continue being a watcher and like watch and comment on people, people's videos and let them know you exist. That's a good thing for people who are making videos as well. But if you find that you don't like it, then don't make yourself do it, obviously. My number one tip is to like make yourself seen, make yourself known, comment on videos that you have something to say about. Even if it's a passing casual thought like, oh yeah, I read and like that, that book too. Let someone know that, that's helpful, that's nice to hear even if it isn't something like super deep and analytical, it's still nice to know that someone watched your video and thought literally anything about it that was nice. So um, definitely comment. I've, I've, I've been trying to comment more often this year in particular, and I think it's been really nice and I feel more connected to the community than ever. So that is my number one tip is just comment a lot. You're not bothering people, I promise. Someone asked me if I ever had a blog or if I ever considered having a blog and what I, why I chose booktube over having a blog. I've never had a book blog. I'm just not a person who reads book blogs. I know that they're out there, but I just don't really have them in my like internet rotation. So I never think to look at them or look for them. So I don't read book blogs and booktube just seemed like a really easy accessible platform to get involved on. Maybe it feels less like that now, but it was so small and so like emerging that it felt really easy to just join in on the conversation and feel like I was saying something and I had already been a big YouTube fan. I have been a nerd fighter for longer than I've been on booktube. Um, so I was very active in that online community and, and I've been to VidCon several times. So like I was already really invested in YouTube as a platform, which made me all the more wanting to join YouTube. Someone else asked, have you ever thought when you started booktube that you'll get many fans, viewers, subscribers from different parts of the world, like myself from India? <laughs> no, honestly, I never thought that someone from India would be watching my videos. So thank you. That makes me really happy. Sabrina from Stakeachino asked what review that I posted am I most proud of and why? Um, and what non-review video am I most proud of and why? I mentioned this a little while ago, but I am really proud of the review video I did earlier in the year that was reviewing uh, the Joy Luck Club and Please Look After Mom side by side. It was just happenstance that I read those two books back to back and they had really similar themes and I had a really good time just like thinking about them in conjunction with each other and then talking about it. I also was really happy with my um, Asian American recommendations video. I know that was also pretty recent, but I was really, really happy with that as well. But I'm gonna look at my most popular ones. Um, it's kind of funny. Some of my most popular videos I've actually privated because I just didn't want people to watch them anymore. Um, surprising to me, my 1Q84 review video has almost 20,000 views. That's bananas. I really liked all of the, the Murakami related videos I did though when I was doing my half year of Murakami. Um, I really liked making those. I thought a lot about them. I was really proud of the, the result there. And then in terms of non-review videos, um, one of the ones that I found the most fun and most fulfilling was doing my audiobook recommendation video. Once I'd listened to a hundred audiobooks, I decided to highlight my favorites. I don't remember 
how many I put in there, but um, that was a little over a year ago, and I, I really enjoyed doing that. And I think that once I get to another 100, I want to make another recommendation video. But I was really, really happy with that one too. That one definitely sticks out. And then also my um, where to start with Japanese literature video. I really like that one. Um, although it gets a lot of dumb comments about people asking me why I don't have more classics on there, or like why I don't have so-and-so. And I very distinctly remember saying like, I'm not a Japanese scholar. I've not read a lot of the classics. This is just what I like and what I think is accessible. But people just like did not listen to that at all, of course. Manga Hoarder asked, if, what are my favorite videos to film? And if they're the ones that I'm the most proud of? Um, so I, I really like making wrap ups because I think that it's a really good time to reflect on what I read in the past month. And it forces me to sit down and think about like what I really liked about these books and what I thought about them um, and how I would rank them in conjunction to each other and, and think about them in like a similar context. I think that that's really helpful for me and makes me remember what I've read a lot better. So I look forward to making those every month. The ones I'm most proud of are definitely the ones that I came up with on my own that I thought were like unique to my channel and like really emphasized my, my unique voice and my unique perspective based on what I like to read and what I think about when I'm reading. So I'm proud of when I get to show showcase that and feel like I'm, I'm making like original, creative, unique content, which doesn't happen all the time. But um, I am happy when I do that and when it's well received because sometimes you make stuff that you're proud of that no one cares about. Nessa from Jabaski asked me what my plans are for my like the future of my channel. I'd love to make more recommendation videos like I did for my, my Asian American recommendations. I really wanted to make one for Pride this year, but I just didn't get around to it, unfortunately. And I, I definitely want to do it next year. Um, I am hoping to highlight some women in translation in August for Women in Translation Month. Um, and I wanna make recommendation videos like that. I also really want to make a video series about being in grad school because I was surprised at how little information there actually was about first person perspectives of being in grad school and doing a, a library and information science program. And I was ho thinking of doing something similar in a way to Hannah Witten's Hormone Diaries, where I just do like maybe once a month a video about my experience in grad school, what it's like, what I'm learning, what how the pace of graduate school is different from, from university or college um, and, and those sorts of things. And I think this would be a good place to do that because I know that there are a lot of librarians, a lot of prospective librarians and graduate students, um, and also people just like books and reading in libraries and might find that interesting. Hopefully they do, but I would like to do that for sure. Someone also asked me, I'm getting deep again, how I feel about the no spoilers policy that seems to be unspoken on booktube and if it impedes the reviewer's job or if I feel like I can still go into depth without giving away major plot points. I definitely like watching non-spoilery reviews of books that I haven't read yet. I think it's very informative. It is helpful for me if I know someone I, I, whose uh, opinion I really respect and, and share taste with. If they liked a book, I like to hear their, their opinions on it and some of the things they gleaned from it without giving away the plot. I think that's important. Um, but I do also think it's important to spoil things if things that are gross or potentially triggering are used as plot devices or, or plot twists. I think that that can be deeply troubling um, and it's something that I think that, like it's obviously not my job as a reviewer to give every possible trigger warning for every possible book. But like for instance, I made a video about this, um, Boy Snowbird by Helen Oyeyemi. I feel like it used someone being trans is kind of a plot twist. And um, they were also kind of a villain and it was kind of gross. And I felt like it was bad trans rep and potentially even transphobic. And I felt like that was important to, to say and to note and people didn't like that, but that's how I felt about it. And I think that that was important to put out there. And I've had a lot of people fight me on it, but I stand by how I felt. And so I feel like if sexual assault or racism or racial violence are ever used as like plot devices or plot twists that are not openly disclosed in like the conceit of the book, then I feel like that, that you can kind of break the no spoilers thing because those things shouldn't be twists. Like sudden sexual assault in the middle of a novel where it feels very unexpected. I will say that that happens because I've, I've been taken aback by things that I didn't anticipate ha those things happening and I feel like it's kind of a lazy twist um, and also potentially damaging. So I definitely appreciate when people do no spoilers, but they're definitely exceptions, especially if the twists can be harmful. Last booktube question. The book barista asked, what do you think has changed the most about your channel in the last five years? Definitely the biggest change other than like having a better camera and having a microphone is my confidence. I do not go back and watch old videos because I think that'd be horribly embarrassing for me and I don't want to put myself through that. But I do feel like I'm much more confident as a reviewer. I do think that I'm more poised and articulate and 
um, just feel better about myself in general. I, I was very self-conscious for most of my life. And in a weird way, I think BookTube has helped me through that. Um, I'm still like not comfortable actually public speaking, but I do feel more comfortable like just speaking as myself and being myself both in front of and not in front of the camera. So I think that my like presentation of myself and my confidence and my self-image have definitely improved on booktube but also kind of because of it now we're into what i called lifestyle i don't know if that's the right category but these are all just like personal questions about my life um a lot of them deal with travel school experience those sorts of things holly berry in 1980 asked how i'm feeling about moving and if my partner has a job lined up already yes my partner does have a job pretty much lined up he is in like ma management level of starbucks so there are starbucks's where we're moving yay and he will be able to work there transfer there pretty pretty seamlessly it's a lot easier for him because he's been with the company for so long but that's what he does and he should be able to transfer so no problems there and then how i'm feeling about moving honestly i just wish it was happening already or had happened the problem with planning things so far in advance and being as organized as i am is now i just am in this like holding pattern where i have to wait and it's driving me crazy i really want to like be packing everything and to like be ready to move tomorrow but i have to wait till the end of the month and it's kind of awful a lot of other things have been like bad in life also recently so it's just like feels like there's a lot of weight on my shoulders and it feels overwhelming but I'm really excited about it and I'm looking forward to it and I can't wait for it but I wish that it had just happened already. Amara Anderson asked about my school experience, what I studied and what I do now. So I'm currently unemployed but I'm going to be moving to upstate New York in about a month's time to attend graduate school. I'm going to graduate school for a master's in library and information studies program. Before that I was briefly a software developer and before that I was a university student and I majored in English and Japanese. I had considered library sciences for a while um, when I was a senior in college but I just felt so overwhelmed with school that I didn't want to do school anymore. So I didn't want to do graduate school. I didn't think I wanted to do graduate school. So I'm glad that I've had a three year gap, but I'm looking forward to going back to school again. Ooh, someone asked me what I do for my hair. Um, they say, I have curly hair and I live in Colorado too. And, and my hair is gnarly and gross, but yours looks amazing. And any tips on how to handle curly hair in a dry environment? I've dealt with a lot of confidence issues with my hair for a long time. Pretty much I didn't, feel confident in my appearance until I discovered that hair straighteners existed and then I straightened my hair every day of high school and um, like half of college because I didn't know how to take care of it and I was tired of people telling me how much they envied my hair because you don't. Like it's hard to take care of, it takes more work, it takes more money, it's a, a huge pain and also like no one cool when I was growing up had cool curly hair. It was like not a trendy thing to have and the only cool person that had curly hair was Hermione Granger who never felt confident about herself until she like magically straightened it in the fourth book so I had some confidence problems with my hair but I feel like I finally have it under control now basically the big biggest change for me is that I get different haircuts now I get diva curl haircuts which is a system where they cut your hair while it's dry and they cut all the curls individually as opposed to cutting your hair straight when it's wet um, so that way like it kind of like encourages the curl pattern that naturally happens in your hair and and the length makes more sense I don't know so that was the biggest change that I made but I can show you the products that I use right now so I don't have any products that I stick to necessarily I always use a really moisturizing shampoo and conditioner that are usually geared toward curly hair specifically but those are wet and then the shower so I didn't pull those out but that's just kind of what I use I'm not really married to any one particular brand and then in terms of styling again I play with products a lot but this is what I'm using right now that I really like. So first is the Diva Curl brand Believe In Gel. Just do like a pump or two of this and it helps with texture and volume. Um, I always use some kind of like leave-in conditioner product. So this is Miss Jessie's leave-in conditioner. Um, it doesn't smell great, but I found this in the curly haired aisle at Target. This seems to do a good job. Definitely helps with frizz. And then I also use a mousse. This is just Herbal Essences. Totally twisted curling mousse. And then I just kind of like, you know, scrunch my hair while it's wet. I only wash my hair every other day, basically, and um, I let it air dry. So those are the things that I do. I don't know if it's the best thing to do, but this is what I've kind of learned through lots of experimentation and trial and error. Uh, let's see, someone asked me what my favorite thing about my cat is. She's over there sleeping somewhere, probably. Um, I love how squat she is. So she's an adult cat, but she's very stocky. So she's nine pounds, not too small, but she's just very stocky and she has short little legs. So she's very compact um, and her face is kind of squashed as well. And she's just very round. And I think that's really cute. Also, I like that she cuddles with me a lot. She is a big 
sleep cuddler. So I will sleep with kind of my arm out to the side and she'll just kind of nestle in my like armpit area and we cuddle and it's great. I also had a couple people ask me about my Japanese language learning experience. I took Japanese language from college and I think that that's the best way to do it, to have a classroom environment motivating you because it's not an easy language to learn and without the incentive of grades and tests and like in classroom practice and stuff, I think it's really easy to give up because of the difficulty. Um, because like learning how to read is the thing you have to teach yourself to do. And it's not the easiest thing. Um, I'd say a month into my first Japanese language class, I'd already signed up to be a major. So I loved it very deeply from the get. And I think it was great, but I tried teaching myself Japanese in high school and I just, I didn't want to learn hiragana and katakana. It was very hard to learn by myself. So I gave up. If you don't have the benefit of a classroom, the books I used, so I used Genki. This is Genki one. This is Genki two. These are both like, beginning and intermediate Japanese language textbooks. This one will help you learn hiragana and katakana, like there's a chart in the front. These I think were, were good textbooks. I had no complaints with them. They came with an audio CD that was also nice so you could hear some native language. And they do a good job of learning, of teaching you um, vocab and grammar and a little bit of beginner's kanji. And then for my advanced class, we used Tobira, which is like, hardcore. It's mostly grammar and kanji, this book. Um, and then like the actual lessons are just essays that you read. My particular favorite chapter is the one where you learn about Ando Momofuku, who is the inventor of the cup noodle. So those are the textbooks I used. And that was my like major learning resource in the classroom. Also having teachers was very helpful. So I think that taking a class is like the best thing that you can do for yourself. Um, but if you don't have that as an option, there's a website called Tofugu which is a Japanese culture blog, but they also have a huge education section where they have tons of online resources for your, like teaching yourself Japanese. Um, and, and I know it links to books, websites, podcasts, all kinds of stuff. Um, they also have some language learning tools they've de developed themselves. And one of them is called Ani Kani, which is the best way that I found to learn kanji. Um, I was learning kanji really fast and they really stuck in my brain. You do have to pay for it, but it's a great system if you're really committed to Japanese. And then someone also asked me about Japanese history books. So I, again, haven't really read any Japanese history books for fun, but I do have the t two textbooks that I did when I did Japanese history classes. So the one that I had for just like the curse, like introductory Japanese history class I took was this one, which is Japan, the world history, which was fine. I have no distinct memories of it, but I think it did the job. And then for my class that I took on like modern Japanese history, which is basically like 1860 to present, um, we use this one, which is a modern history of Japan, which I thought was a pretty good textbook. But again, it's a textbook, so I don't know how fun it would be to use just like for fun. Claire from Claire Reads Books asked me what place I would most like to travel to in the future. And I would love to do more traveling in Japan. I only really spent time in Tokyo and a little bit of time in Nikko, but I would love to spend more time in other parts of the country. Um, I mean, I basically just like living every second of my life so I can go back to Japan. That's all I really want to do. Um, so I want, that's like my number one travel des destination, but I really want to do more traveling in general. Every time I travel, I am reminded of how much I like it and how much I learn from it and how it always expands my worldview, even though like, even just like going to London last year, I feel like really expanded my, my worldview. But I'd love to do more traveling in Europe. Um, I'd love to go to Seoul. I'd really love to do more traveling in, in Asia, kind of all over the place, but Seoul was like the big destination that I have other than Japan. And then more traveling in the United States, honestly, because I don't need a passport to do that. It's a lot cheaper than traveling internationally. And there are so many parts of the country I've never seen. Like I, I really would love to see Alaska. I've never been to Alaska. Um, and hopefully because I'll be living on the East Coast, I can do some traveling in the East Coast because I've really honestly never been to any of those places. So that'd be fun too. She also asked me what I will miss most about Colorado when I move and what I will miss the least. I'm gonna miss the mountains a lot. When you're in Colorado, that's how you know what direction is west. I don't know what people do when they don't have mountains to use, um, but you can see them from pretty much everywhere and they look different every single day. Uh, I feel very attached to them and I will miss them a lot. Obviously, I also miss my friends, but I will miss the mountains and also the sun because you might not know this, but Colorado is so sunny. It's the sun shines here almost every single day. And even in the winter time, it might snow a foot and then it'll melt almost instantly because of the, the sun is so hot because of the atmosphere. Um, and that's a really nice thing to have. What I will miss the least is probably this is going to sound awful, but the people it's become a very popular place for people to move. And it's very like 
romanticized for people who are not from here. And it's sad because it's becoming very gentrified and very expensive to live here. And so it's a lot different than the place that I grew up. Um, and and the, the big tech culture and the big weed culture, I just, I'm tired of it. Um, like, hooray for marijuana being legal. I do not smoke it, though, so I don't want to talk about it all the time or smell it all the time. And yeah, we'll just, no. Someone did ask me if I'd considered living in Japan. I think this is gonna be the last question I answer. And yes, I did. When I was studying Japanese, I was convinced that I was gonna go to graduate school for Japanese. I was gonna be a Japanese scholar, and then I was gonna move to Japan, and I was gonna be a translator. But none of that happened. And a lot of that was because I didn't want to move to Japan. There are some logistical issues, like my partner not being able to move because he was in school and not wanting to do long distance from that long of a distance. But also, Japanese culture is not the most inviting to people who are not Japanese. And it's also not the best place to be if you are a woman. So those two things were barriers right away um, and would disenfranchise me from a lot of opportunities. I know it's getting better or whatever, but like, those are two strikes against me in like really fitting in in Japanese culture. And like, I'll never be considered Japanese. So I'm automatically like kind of on a lower rung. Um, and like getting citizenship is basically impossible. And um, it's very expensive to live there if you want to live somewhere like Tokyo. Um, but like women in particular have a lot fewer opportunities in companies. Um, and it's such a company cult culture, the, the Japanese culture. I've never lived there, so I don't know how true those things are, but there are things I heard a lot about when I was studying the culture. So those were definitely barriers. And I also realized that like becoming basically like native in Japanese is so hard and not impossible for a native English speaker. And I'd have to devote my whole life to it. And I love Japanese language, but I just felt very overwhelmed by the whole prospect. So while I did consider moving to Japan, it just was unrealistic and undesirable for a lot of reasons. And those are, those are like the main reasons why I felt like I didn't wanna do it. So I'm gonna, I think, cut it off here because I've been filming for a really long time. And um, I'm so I apologize if I didn't get to your question, but rest assured you're still entered into the giveaway. I do want to make it clear that I like so, so appreciate all the questions I got. And I hope this was fun and interesting. And I hope you learned something new about me, probably, hopefully. All right, so we're gonna pick the winners. I'm just gonna go to random.org. The winner of A Tale for the Time Being is Stephanie Rodriguez. The winner of A Place Called Winter is Ariel Jocelyn. The winner of A Little Life is Green Sweater Weather. The winner of Never Let Me Go is The Book Barista. And the winner of The Essex Serpent is Ruthrin Ravendran. Apologize if I pronounced any of your names incorrectly. Um, I will be contacting you via personal message through YouTube. So look out for those if I announced your name. If I don't hear from you in about a week, I'm probably gonna pick other winners, but I wanna give you some time to, to get through that. And I'll be messaging you there so I can get your address so I can send you the book. So congratulations to the winners. Thank you everyone who asked questions. I had a lot of fun doing this. I am basically out of drink and my battery light is flashing. So I'm gonna go edit this now. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for five years. Here's to many more, I hope, and I will see you next time. Bye.